Welcome to BK Gardens, hope you're doing great. It is officially summer 2020. It's been a crazy spring. We've had COVID-19. We've had some excitement here in the backyard. Um, mostly positive, we had a 65 foot tree fall, which was unanticipated, but luckily no one was hurt and none of the garden beds were injured. Today I wanna to give you an update on where we are with growing for 2020. Things we're seeing, lessons I've learned. Every season is different. I wanna share some of those things that I've learned this spring and how I'm preparing for the heat and the summer to be prepared for the maximum harvesting and maximum reward for all the gardening work we've done this spring. So first stop, Sun Gold Tomatoes. It has been an epic spring and we are off to a fast start. This is a jungle of Sun Gold Tomatoes. You know, this year I did transition from having these in planters and um, had about five, six planters here, always in this corner, because this is the corner of hot, extreme sun in the afternoon. We get about um, three to four hours of peak sun in July and August here, which these things love. They love water and heat. You got those two ingredients with good soil, you are gonna get a ton of sun gold tomatoes. Switched over to a cedar garden bed. Um, if you know anything about, uh, if you watch the BK Gardens episode, you know I'm obsessed with these things. They are the sweetest, the best tomato in the world. Check out my love letter to the Sun Gold Tomato episode. These things, um, so a few things about this spring. First, I uh, switched over to this cedar garden bed, which I built from scratch um, earlier in the spring. And uh, threw 10 plants in here, which, hey, that's some high density gardening. Probably should have given a little more space. So you can see these things are growing up vertically pretty high. Uh, I've never seen it more dense this early in the season. You know, we're about a week away from our first um, sun golds. They're actually potentially even as early as tomorrow. We have a pool in the house of when the first is gonna be ready. I'm ambitious, I'm saying tonight we're gonna have our first one. But these things are so delicious. Um, you know, a few surprises about this spring. Number one is just how much they've grown, how fast they've grown. Big tip I recommend for any gardener is keep records of what you're growing. Every season is a little different and every garden is different. Whether you, uh, you know, have a big backyard in the suburbs or here, here in like Brooklyn where you're dealing with a more con condensed space, keeping track of records is really important. Really simple, you don't need to be like developing ledgers. I just keep a simple spreadsheet of what I grew last season, when I planted it, how much I planted, so I can go back, check records, really get to know exactly what's gonna perform in what areas of the garden, so I can look at my records. Look, last year I know we harvested, um, we transferred our sun golds May 15th last year, 2019, outside, and we had our first sun golds July 1st. Okay, this year, we did our transfer on May 16th, so a day later, and they're a little bit ahead of schedule. So I know exactly, hey, when I gotta be planning things and you know, and what's happening. So I can like see, hey, what's working, what's not. If something's not coming up, I can flag it. It's like, hey, what's happening? I've seen that happen. Um, loving it, I see a ton of pollinators in here. The other big surprise, so keeping records, hugely important, very easy to do, simple spreadsheet keep every year a little bit different. I've been keeping records now for a few years and it is hugely helpful in terms of my learning curve because you know what's unique to my garden, like these sun gold tomatoes, another huge surprise was, you know, I started growing these uh, from seed in the basement around March 4th, 5th under the grow lights. Um, and you know what, we I was targeting about 25 to 30, uh, keep about 10 to 14 for myself and then give away the rest. Huge surprise was we got a ton of volunteer uh, sun gold plants. Uh, volunteer plants are plants that pop up in other beds, which you did not intend. Um, I've experienced a little bit of it. This year was a wave of sun gold tomatoes. My theory is that at the end of the season last year, I composted a bunch of sun gold tomatoes into the compost bin, and um, with that, came a lot of seeds and that compost that I did uh, we do a lot of homegrown compost I'll get to it in the back um, went to a lot of beds net result is I wound up with in I stopped weeding a lot of my beds because I saw all these plants coming up and I was like curious I was like I think those are sun gold tomatoes 
wound up with about 75 extra sun gold tomato plants. It was a sun gold giveaway bonanza here on 10th Street in Brooklyn. Gave away a ton. And, you know, gave away, and, and long way of saying, you know, at, um, what's specific to my gardening and growing sun gold tomatoes here? As you can see, they kind of love it here. I have to build additional trellis structure just to keep them contained. And I'm gonna have to build more pretty soon. Uh, this should generate somewhere in the order of 2,000 tomatoes, believe it or not. Um, but like, hey, uh, uh, Lawrence, who lives a few doors down, he was one of the beneficiaries of my Sun Gold Tomatoes. He gave me an update. It's not growing great. Uh, Jen down the block uh, is growing. They're doing great. But keeping records about what's growing and what's working for your plants is hugely important. Next stop, let's go to uh, cucumbers. Okay, so the cucumbers have been off to a pretty slow start uh, this year. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, you can see here are the cages I built. Uh, these cages are about now three plus years old. Um, built these from scratch. Really, it was a necessary um, construction because squirrels, saw squirrel again this morning, uh, trying to get in here. These guys get in here and they love the cucumbers. So. This keeps it out very easy um, to keep um, protected. You know, once I built this, um, you know, have a trellis in the back for them to vine up because cucumbers definitely want to vine up. Um, the, the variety that I've done the best with is uh, I use Johnny um, Select Seeds, uh, the Katrina uh, cucumber over here. You can see it's starting to vine up. This one's starting to come back. Um, you know what? It, uh, I think we're going to do fine with these. It's just going to be a little bit later than usual. Over here, I was doing Persian uh, cucumbers. For some reason, they didn't take. Um, there's some coming up. I did a, a, a reseeding, and you know, hopefully we'll get some germination, but these are off to a slow start. Got to keep an eye on them. Um, again, that's part of gardening is like, hey, you're going to find things that work one season, didn't work the next. You just try to keeping records, which I mentioned earlier. That's why it's hugely important. Um, you know, like a few years ago, I learned like, hey, I was having a ton of um, flowers, but no cucumbers were, were being produced. And I called up Johnny Select Seeds. They're great uh, in terms of answering questions about why your seeds aren't germinating. And they asked two questions. They said, hey, has it been rainy or has it been cold? And I said, yes, and yes. And they said, you know what? You're not getting enough bees or pollinators. Sure enough. Um, I actually did some manual po pollinating, which is not hard to do, actually pretty fascinating with this little brush uh, connecting the uh, female uh, flower to the male, and then got some pollination done manually. You gotta do what you gotta do. But uh, sure enough, like a week later, things started drying up, pollinators started coming in, and then had a great season of cucumber. So hopefully these will come together. We'll get, do another post later in the summer. Let's check out the microgreens. Microgreens. Microgreens are amazing nutritionally. You know, I had learned about them over the last few years going to restaurants. They're becoming more popular. You find them more on uh, restaurants in terms of salad or being combined with an entree. I knew about their nutritional values, but it wasn't until I started growing them this winter Check out my episode on growing microgreens. It's super easy. It was such an epiphany that they're A, delicious, um, really nutritious. Uh, the, the vitamins and health benefits of them are amazing. And third, they are the easiest thing to grow. Like these, um, and they're traditionally thought of as like, hey, a winter thing or indoor gardening because they are so easy to grow. But you know, I've been doing them basically all spring. And uh, so like, I've discovered a, the ones that I find are the fastest growing um, is this salad mix, basic salad mix, uh, spinach, and uh, kale. Those are the three that I use the most. I use True Leaf Market, check them out for the seeds. And uh, you know, from these, I, these seeds I threw down yesterday, these will be ready to eat in about seven days, which is an I still can't get my head around how fast it is from basically seed to germination to harvest. There's nothing more productive I've ever grown and these things are truly superfood. So don't uh, deny yourself the opportunity to use microgreens if you're not using them. 
incorporate them in your growing routine. You will not regret it. And also, eat them in the summer. You know, they're, they're a great uh, plant. You know, we, hey, we expand our growing opportunity. Obviously, our peak growing is the summer seasons, but using microgreens as a part of it is great. The other nice benefit about microgreens is that, you know, because I grow them in trays, I don't have to worry about insects because what I do is I grow them. I left these out last night covered, just trying to keep the weight on them for germination, keep them moist, and then tomorrow I'll take the cover off. At night, I can move them in the kitchen. Very easy, take two trays and maybe three, and I don't have to worry about aphids or any other uh, spider mites getting to these, or invasive insects. Good way to keep them protected. I know some folks have had some problems. Kate, I'm thinking about you with your aphids. She's a new microgreen grower. You know, take them inside. You're gonna be fine and safe. Next up, let's look at uh, what else is growing down here. Okay, so I wanna take a quick pause here. These are not sun gold tomatoes. These are some very special tomatoes that I received from a New Jersey gardener who's a very dear friend, Walt Driscoll, who unfortunately passed away this week. Uh, Walt was a very dear friend of my parents and I've known him basically since I was one year old uh, in New Jersey. Um, he sent these to me when he learned I was getting into gardening more and more. He uh, sent me a package, a little envelope last year with seeds. He said, these are my best of New Jersey tomatoes, uh, 4th of July tomatoes, uh, Bodacious Hybrid, I love these names, Ramapo Hybrid and Super Steak Hybrid. He sent them on to me. I seeded them, they're doing great. Um, I cannot wait to eat these, uh, Walt. I know you're looking down on us. You know, the story of how I heard Walt pass this week is very poignant and I think exactly the way I want to go. He was out gardening, uh, came into the house, had a, a glass of red wine. Walt loved his uh, red wine, laid down on the couch and never woke up again. That is exactly the way I want to go. Walt, we love you, miss you, and I look forward to eating these in tribute to you. Okay, so this is a new bed for uh, 2020. This bed I was prior using for a mishmash of things. I was actually using it for some of my um, raspberries that I was starting in 2019, which are now coming to maturity and full uh, production this year. Um, so I decided I was gonna do more kale, and it, this is my calibration bed, horrible pun intended. Um, and it's been doing great. You know, we, I just did, as you can see, it's kind of like a mishmash, a wall of kale here. Just threw in a ton of seeds, doing some high density gardening, not being concerned with spacing, and it's done great. You know, I can see I have my uh, chicken wire mesh on here. Um, if you want to get more tips on how to protect your veggies from animals, birds, check out my other episode on protecting your uh, beds from critters. Um, the nice thing about kale that I find here, they're not as susceptible to invasive insects. There's a little bit of eating going on here. My gut is it's from some snails, but um, they've done really well here in, um, in terms of production. And just checking here to see if there are any spider mites there. I don't see any. Um, by the way, this is not a real snake. This is a cobra, but not indigenous to uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, have been doing great. Let's go over and check out the other leafy greens where we are having a little bit of trouble with spider mites right now. Okay, so here are the two beds of leafy greens. Um, I can see I have a little bit of kale in the back, but mostly it's a butterleaf lettuce. Uh, butterleaf lettuce, uh, so delicious. It is, um, you know, you almost, you need the, the, the slightest amount of dressing on it to make it taste delicious. It's so fresh. Um, and then also over here have arugula uh, and a little bit more kale. Uh, you know, takeaway here is you can see I have veggie mesh on here. Um, veggie mesh uh, does a really nice job to protect. Before I used this and I just had chicken wire, definitely saw a lot more invasive insects eating my hard earned, hard grown leafy greens. Um, but you know, most part it's done a good job. What I have been finding over the last few weeks and month um, is a little bit more spider mites. You can see some right here actually. And so what I did yesterday with the help of my noble assistant, 
we made some homegrown again we don't want to use insecticide this is an organic garden we try to be organic as much as we can keep it natural what's going in the garden it really affects the taste and we just don't want this turned into to a chemical based uh, garden it affects the flavor it, it, and also we want to make sure hey nutritional value is never compromised so this is just uh, dr bronner's uh, soap unscented baby soap uh, one tablespoon and then a quart of water then just kind of spraying it a little bit in there obviously got to do a better spray than that and then what I'll do is um, spray above and below the leaves and that should get rid of most of them you know um, and then we'll obviously when we wash the uh, lettuce it'll help with it um, we'll let you know how this goes this is brand new trial and error here on this but overall the leafy greens have been doing great the veggie mesh also really helps you know you our goal my goal here is like I'm not too precious with the stuff I'm, I'm not I'll eat a leaf that has a little bit of munched uh, insect um, holes in it but it, again want to protect as much as we can the food that we're growing let's head to the back check out the pollinators the compost bin and last but not least the raspberries pollinators hugely important for your garden I didn't appreciate till I really started growing vegetables and fruit how important pollinators are so I do emphasize uh, I most of my focus is not on the aesthetics of the garden it's definitely on growing food it's what the whole thing uh, ethos of BK gardens is but you know what now that I've learned the importance of pollinators I try to create a really swank delicious irresistible backyard for pollinators and bees and other beneficial insects so what I've done is uh, like I grow these are candula uh, marigolds I do bee balm I also do lavender and then sunflowers sunflowers are the easiest thing to grow great for pollinators these things will grow these are planted about a month ago they'll grow to about three or four feet high have some in the back already growing tremendously well great environment for pollinators don't forget your bees hugely important to your growing and your success of your garden okay so we've covered cucumbers tomatoes leafy greens pollinators you know, one thing that I've been missing from the garden for a few years after a failed attempt at growing watermelon, don't recommend growing watermelon if you live in a small urban garden. You need space. You got to research these things. I did not. Is uh, I was really determined to get fruit back in the garden. And so you, two years ago, I got some dormant roots, stems of uh, raspberries. And I started planting them. You know, the cycle for raspberries, it takes patience. It's typically two years. First year is to really establish them. The second year you get the fruit. So we are in year two and we are starting to see the raspberries come in. We have two varieties here, actually three varieties. We have some spring, early summer varietals, which are coming um, ripe now. Actually very excited. Starting to see some blackberries coming through here too. Awesome. Um, so these will come through basically from now we'll get our spring varietals I kind of forgot which is which I've consolidated them all in this area of the garden which was pretty much dormant this was like the one area of the garden that we had some hydrangeas that were kind of not the best, best shape so we ripped them out added another bed and created a patch for raspberries blackberries over here um, super stoked for these these have been coming through already pretty well and we should have them pretty much for the whole summer and into early fall. Okay, so the other exciting thing that happened uh, this spring, about a month ago, we were sitting in bed around 9.30 and we heard something and I was like, what the heck was that? We thought we had a plant fall in the house, we bought some new plants, but it turned out it was an Alanthus altissima. That was right there where there's now sunflowers taking hold. Um, completely fell along here miraculously this Alanthus altissima it's also known as the ghetto palm these things grow anywhere they're not the most beautiful tree by any means they're known as like the rat tree also um, the hell tree because they grow they're so uh, an invasive tree it kind of grows anyway we knew this thing was rotted we didn't know how rotted it fell on a night when there was no wind but amazingly fell on the little bit of damage to the fence the calibration bed 
It was unharmed. Little miracle of nature. Thank you, God. Um, and that was uh, our big event. So amazingly, now I have an area over there. We have a little bit more sun, which is awesome. And actually, when the guys came, I was like, do not throw out that Atlantis Altacena wood chips. This is all going on the garden. So the hell tree is now going on the compost. Um, that's it for the update. You know, the quick things to keep in mind uh, for the rest of you know the season and what is on my mind as I'm planning for summer is watering system. I you know have this whole garden set up on a dig watering system, drip lines. So that is a priority. You can see right here. Make sure you have a watering plan and definitely look into setting up a, uh, a basic watering system. This is very easy to do. You just want to make sure that your sizes are consistent for some unforeseen reason or explanation is that these companies, the tubing size, like read carefully whether it's um, half inch, this is half inch tubing on the outside or the inside. They literally separate one company measures it by the inside of the piping and the other the outside which is completely backwards to me but that's the way they do it and uh you know make sure you have your watering set up i got my new swank five gallon watering can and this new um i think it's called a g-force um uh hose which is anti-kink hose i should have got this thing years ago my new my old hose just broke have your watering plan mapped out and also make sure that you're planning to do some compost amendment during the season you know these plants like over here these sun gold tomatoes they are pulling a ton of nutrients as they transform into this wonderful fruit there's our first sun gold tomatoes you know the plants are growing tremendously fast right now you can see my sun gold tomatoes i'm very excited we're gonna start eating those potentially tonight but you also got to be mindful of you know, making sure the soil, they're, these plants, these sun gold tomatoes, are pulling a tremendous amount of nutrients out of the soil to grow. They're using solar power, the sun, water, and all of the nutrients in the soil and compost. So what I'll be doing over the next few weeks is um, really probably mid-July, is putting a layer of compost over all my beds as I replant more kale and lettuce and in my sun gold tomatoes you know put a layer on there which that new compost will be new nutrients that can go back into the plants to sustain these as they continue to grow and produce fruit hopefully you know these produced into late no late October early November last year and hopefully we'll have that success again in 2020 so that's it. Those are my tips. That's what I've been up to this spring. That's what I'm thinking about as I prepare for summer. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions on how you're doing it better, I want to know. Hit me up. Please leave a comment. If this was helpful, please hit like or subscribe. From BK Gardens, this is Sean Duggan signing off. Keep growing. See you soon.